John Schneider and Ashley Tang. Ashley's going to present. Uh, let me briefly introduce. Uh, w the the Buckspam Institute has been trying to encourage uh, interactions between faculty members and students, um, also between um, faculty members in different departments. Uh, John Schneider uh, is in the Department of Medicine, also is the director of the Global Health Programs for the Infectious Disease Section, and was recently appointed the first director of the University of Chicago's Center for HIV Elimination. Um, and, and John has been working with Ashley Sang, a second year medical student, um, a graduate of the University of North Carolina, uh, who came to uh, Pritzker uh, two years ago and has also spent two years working as a CDC public health associate in infectious disease epidemiology in the New Mexico Department of Health. That was before medical school, right? Uh, to their topic today is enhancing the provider-patient relationship at sites beyond the University of Chicago. Ashley, please. John, thank you. Um, okay. So I'm actually really happy to be going after Dr. Milner's talk about mentorship because I'm co-presenting with my mentor, Dr. Schneider. Um, we've worked together on a couple different projects now. He was my mentor for the summer research program, and he's also my faculty advisor for the Schweitzer Fellowship. Um, so we're going to be talking about the provision of health care to vulnerable populations, um, which happens often outside of a hospital setting. Um, often with a non-physician provider and is often resource limited. Understanding and developing the patient-provider relationships in these settings is important to understanding and improving patient outcomes. So today you'll be hearing about two different projects. First, I'll be talking about an overdose prevention program that I started at Cook County Jail. And second, Dr. Schneider will be talking about um, pre-exposure prophylaxis at an FQHC. So to start my section, I wanted um, to talk about the study that looked at causes of mortality in former inmates. So in this graph on the x-axis, you can see um, time following release from incarceration. And on the y-axis is mortality rate. And the dotted line there represents uh, mortality rate in the general population. And the bars represent uh, mortality rate from all causes in uh, former inmates. And as you can see, there's a huge spike in the first two weeks following release. So right after people are leaving jail or prison. And over 70% of the deaths during this period were due to overdose death. One of the best ways that we have to prevent overdose is to provide um, drug users, their families, and um, their communities with naloxone. So naloxone, for those who don't know, is a medication that reverses the effects of opiate overdose. And the CDC now recommends that overdose prevention education and the provision of naloxone be part of any standard treatment for opiate-dependent people. And here in the state of Illinois, we have a uh, supportive law that allows non-medical people to carry and administer naloxone um, in cases of overdose. Um, this strategy for preventing overdose has been hugely successful. In Chicago, the largest organization that provides naloxone to drug using communities is Chicago Recovery Alliance. And to date, they have over 5,000 documented peer-to-peer -peer overdose reversals. So the goal of my program was to work with um, Chicago Recovery Alliance and bring their resources to Cook County Jail. And we focused on working with two divisions that were already providing substance abuse treatment and mental health services to the detainees. And these services were provided by Selena and Associates and Gateway um, Foundation. So these were our partners. Uh, so far, um, we started by providing training directly to detainees. So, so far, we've trained over 400 people. And it's been a really eye-opening experience because less than 10% of the people we've trained were even familiar with Chicago Recovery Alliance. And even fewer knew about naloxone and the um, overdose prevention resources that were available to them. And yet, close to 50% had experienced overdose personally or had witnessed overdose in someone that they knew. Um, and our goal also was not just to tra train detainees, but also to train the staff. So the staff of Selena Associates and Gateway Foundation, these are the mental health clinicians, the substance abuse counselors, the social workers that are providing services to um, these patients on a day-to-day -day basis. And we wanted to also train them to become overdose prevention educators. Um, 
virtually all of the experience staff that we've trained so far have had uh, clients, have had patients who have died of overdose, and yet none of them had ever been trained in overdose prevention. Um, so far, we've trained over 20 members of the staff. And our goals in training the staff were threefold. First, we wanted to increase the sustainability of our program. Second, we wanted to improve um, the delivery of our message by having it uh, through an existing therapeutic relationship. And third, we wanted to enhance the existing provider-patient relationship by giving these clinicians another way to connect with their patients, another way to um, influence positive change. And these are just some quotes from uh, the staff that were um, emailed to us. For future directions, we hope to continue these trainings with staff and also the detainees. And we're working with the Sheriff's Department to improve access to naloxone for people as they're leaving uh, Cook County Jail. And that's it. Thanks, Ashley. <clears throat> when you bring someone into another setting and you know, also with you know, other family and different things like that, um, it's, it, there's always a little bit of trepidation, but I've always had you know, just random emails from like our colleagues in Athens where uh, Ashley worked saying she was phenomenal. And then with the Schweitzer Fellowship, I've gotten an email from her advisor there as well saying she's wonderful. So um, it's been really uh, great having this relationship. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit on, uh, Ashley presented um, her Schweitzer project. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a project I'm working on with uh, Buxbaum pilot funding uh, to bring um, you know, kind of better provider patient uh, relationship and communication around a very new uh, HIV prevention method that we have. And so hopefully people are familiar with pre-exposure prophylaxis, but um, I'll just tell you quickly that um, this is actually since HIV um, has been in our, our lives since 1980, uh, this is really the first real prevention uh, that we have that um, is something that people have autonomy and they can take it and, and protect themselves. Um, you know, condoms are, you know, there's usually a, a relationship with that sort of prevention. But this is really something that someone can do and just prevent getting HIV. It's highly efficacious uh, when properly taken. So this is one of the breakthroughs, very new. Uh, it was um, uh, proven in a randomized controlled trial in 2010. Um, FDA approved in 2012, and so we're just now getting a sense of how are we really going to implement this in, in real settings, which many of these settings are, are outside of the University of Chicago and sort of resource-restricted settings where we come across a lot of uh, populations that are at heightened risk uh, for HIV, particularly on the south side. So um, when we look at uh, PrEP is short for pre-exposure prophylaxis. We see here this is sort of the patient side of things. Um, you know, being at risk for HIV infection, are they ad identified as a PrEP candidate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, PrEP, again, is one pill once a day to prevent HIV. 96% effective, uh, which is higher than, than condom use. Um, over here, I've, I've boxed this area because this is really the provider's uh, side of this. So. Um, you know, there has to be provision of health care to high-risk populations. Um, the providers have to be educated about PrEP and also know how to educate the, the client about PrEP. And they have to be willing to provide PrEP. And so this is the part that I've been working on. Um, I, I mean, I've been working on several parts, but um, for this physician-patient relationship component uh, is an important part for PrEP implementation. So um, we have non-traditional settings, uh, non-traditional providers, and, and, and certainly there's a lot of barriers. Um, so um, I, I spend half a day a week at the Axis Grand Boulevard Clinic, which is a federally qualified health center, um, just about a mile and a half from here, um, which serves um, a lot of HIV-infected patients, but also uh, individuals who are high risk for HIV. And being high risk for HIV means uh, someone who you know, maybe comes in with other sexually transmitted diseases, uh, someone who has a substance use uh, issue um, and, and other uh, sort of um, kind of structural problems. So poverty, um, maybe uh, in, in and out of jail, things like that. Um, I've wanted to focus on, I'm calling these non, I mean, I know family medicine physician, that's a pretty traditional uh, sort of provider. 
um, but usually not engaged as much with HIV prevention and, and definitely not with pre-exposure prophylaxis. So I've, I've been working with nurse practitioners, um, family medicine physicians, and then also other uh, general medicine physicians uh, in the Federally Qualified Health Center to talk about ways that they can identify clients within their practice that may be at risk for HIV and how, if that's the case, how they might be able to start talking about pre-exposure prophylaxis, which again is one of, um, you know, one of the major breakthroughs we've had recently. Um, so I've had, um, I've intervened with uh, three providers so far, uh, a nurse practitioner, a family medicine physician, and a, uh, actually an, an infectious disease provider. Um, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I did with them uh, to, to work on this. But one thing I've, you know, just noticed is the structural barriers in some of these settings. I mean, you know, you, you hear about like, you know, you know, inner city clinics or federally qualified health centers and they're, you know, seeing lots of patients and not much support. And, and certainly there's that. Um, and that's always a, a barrier to care. Um, you know, there, but, but there are other things that are really, um, you know, driving this. So for example, um, Everything in a clinic, like a federally qualified health center, is, is based on, on patient visits. And so, you know, we're starting to feel that at the University of Chicago, uh, but at, at a federally qualified health center, it is, um, it is done with perfection. They get a daily email. There are these targets and things like that. And so there's a lot of pressure, and, um, and you can kind of see it in the provider's uh, this kind of little uh, limited autonomy and ability to make decisions uh, about their, their daily um, daily uh, routine. And so that, that's been something that's been eye-opening to me and something that adds an additional barrier to bringing on another sort of um, prevention piece in the clinic. So I've tried to develop a sense of agency. So what does that mean? That means, you know, helping um, people think that they do have a, a way to, um, you know, ha have a bit of um, ability to work with patients uh, on their own accord. Um, we've we've had one-on-one -on -one lunch meetings uh, to discuss um, ways to um, you know create more time, um, ways to bring this up within the context of other testing that might be done. Um, and, and I'm a big believer of the information, motivation, behavior change model, so IMB. Um, so we provide information, uh, motivate, and then we kind of talk about different scenarios where um, this sort of uh, topic can be brought up. Um, I've built um, the, the core of this based upon some work I did as a medical student uh, looking at different components that were critical to improving adherence uh, to medications in uh, patients, and in this case, HIV-infected patients. And so um, general communication, um, provision of PrEP-specific information, egalitarian decision-making style, that's sort of like the shared decision-making, um, trying to improve satisfaction with care, trust, willingness to recommend physician others. And then the big one is adherence dialogue, and we talk about a lot of ways uh, that people can uh, take medicine. So future directions for this um, is really trying to work within um, this resource-restricted setting to really um, try, try and have providers um, you know, the providers that are there, um, the ones that stay there for a long time are really committed to the, uh, to the physician-patient relationship and patient care. They really care because, you know, otherwise they, they would have other opportunities. Um, but um, so working with them to really, um, working with those who are, are, are new to really try and develop um, practices that, that keep them in these settings. Um, we're going to gather patient-level data on the relationship as well. Uh, these relationships are bi-directional. Um, and then we're going to really start to intervene more on the adherence dialogue piece and uh, measure how that looks moving forward over three years. Thanks. Sure, sure. Okay. Dr. Levinson is asking, what, what would you recommend uh, people get? What, what, what's made it? viable for you yeah. to work in, like, especially in the jail setting right. for you. I'm curious about, yeah. you know, what, what made it possible for other people going into that kind of setting. Um, so for, for our program, really the kind of saving grace was our partners, the Gateway Foundation and Selena and Associates, because they're the ones who actually, um, you know, they get it, because their patients um, have gone out, they've been released from their programs, and they then they hear later, um, often through you know, unofficial means that their former patients have passed away due to overdose. And so actually they were the ones who reached out to us first um, to request 
resources in some settings, and they've been the ones who have kind of opened the doors um, to the more difficult side of the jail to work with, which is the sheriff's department. So really, um, finding partnerships there was extremely helpful. Yeah, I think you know, I think it's a, a mixed bag. I think people really have to want to work there, you know, to get to that threshold. If they're forced to work in that setting, it's never going to work. Um, but uh, you know, I think um, I'm able to see a lot there that I wouldn't be able to see here. Okay, there's you know, it's in a strip mall. There's parking. Um, there's um, you know, I see a lot of younger gay black men who don't have insurance, and so that's uh, a population that I really like working with. And so um, I probably wouldn't be able to see as much of that uh, in, in a different setting. Thank you very much. Our, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Ray Grogan. Uh, Dr. Grogan is a specialist in the surgical treatment of thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal disease, um, and um, very interested in clinical, translational, and basic science research. T today, Dr. Grogan is going to talk about the North American Thyroid Cancer Survivorship Study. Um, that's a big, I think, multi-institutional study, changing survivorship care through improved doctor-patient communication. Ray. Uh, so um, as we just heard, I'm going to be talking about the North American Thyroid Cancer Survivorship Study, uh, also known as NAPCIS. Um, and I have the pleasure of giving a short introduction to the first 1,000 patients that we've been able to recruit into the study. Um, I'd like to say thank you to the Bucksbaum Institute, because without their support, this particular project would not be possible. Um, so uh, just to start out, what is the NATCIS? Um, so NATCIS is a multi-institutional study. Um, you can see over here the centers that are involved. There are seven medical centers um, throughout North America, and including Canada, um, as well as three cancer survivor groups. It includes Thyca, Bite Me Cancer, and Thyroid Cancer Canada. Um, it's a 78-question self-reported questionnaire um, that patients take after they've completed their treatment for thyroid cancer. Um, it has these um, several different um, categories for, from the, uh, the questionnaire. Post-thyroid cancer treatment, demographics, quality of life, psychological well-being, spiritual well-being, and um, any thyroid cancer-specific um, complications um, that they may have had after their surgery. Um, and in the middle here is just a um, screen capture from our website for the study. Uh, the reason this, this study is important um, and what the goals of this study were was to try to understand the discrepancies between what physicians expect to happen to patients after they go through this treatment and what patients are actually experiencing. And is it the fault or is it the, um, well, is it the fault of the physician that we haven't communicated properly with the patient in terms of the fact that they're having worse outcomes than we would expect them to have? And are they really having worse outcomes than we're expecting them to have? Because no one's actually really studied quality of life in thyroid cancer survivors. But anecdotally, from someone who treats thyroid cancer, you get a lot of stories from patients talking about the idea that they're doing much worse than what we as physicians would expect them to be doing. And the question that first came up was, well, is there really something here? Because no one's ever really even looked into this. So that's really what our goal, were, one of our main goals were, just to first define the problem. Once the problem is defined, then we can try to understand how to fix the problem through better communication, through education of physicians and things like that. So this also ties into a mandate from the Institute of Medicine. Um, in 2005, the Institute of Medicine put out a report that was called From Cancer Patient to Cancer Survivor, Lost in Transition. Um, and uh, part of this uh, idea was that they thought that all patients who survived cancer should have a survivorship care plan. And that this should be instituted by the year 2015. I think that pretty much everyone is behind the eight ball on this. Um, but part of the, um, the goal of this Institute of Medicine survivorship care plans was to provide psycho psychosocial um, late effect assessments of these um, cancer survivors, as well as intervention for consequences of cancer and its treatment. So in order for us to be able to do that, though, we have to understand what these effects are in the long term on these patients. And so that was really how this all started. 
So there was a little bit of background information on cancer care survivorship in thyroid cancer patients, but unfortunately, they're all um, well underpowered. Um, so if you do a power analysis, you'll find that you need between 700 and 1,000 patients to get at some of the questions that we were trying to answer. Um, but these preliminary data here do point to an idea that thyroid cancer survivors have a really reduced quality of life. Um, this is a study from Korea that looked at 316 patients. And the other theme that you're going to see here is that all these um, studies were looking at general cancer quality of life and weren't looking specifically at what happens to thyroid cancer care survivors. Uh, this is another study from the Netherlands of 153 patients. Here's one from Singapore of 152 patients. The Singapore study was interesting in the, in the fact that they looked at several different ethnicities, and they found that ethnicity or race also played a role in your quality of life after your cancer care. So um, that's another aspect of the North American Thyroid Cancer Survivorship Study that we want to look into, which is why Canada is being included, and eventually we would like to expand down into Mexico and Central America um, to make it a complete North American study. Um, and here in Finland, you also saw 341 patients, um, which is well underpowered. Um, the idea here is that almost all of these did show a decrease in quality of life that wasn't really expected uh, by most physicians, uh, minus this uh, study from Finland. Uh, so let me just talk a little bit about some of our data. So we ha now have 1,000 participants, 1,000 um, questionnaires. So this is our preliminary data that is well above and beyond any data that's already been published in the literature. Uh, these data we just collected recently, so they're still very preliminary. We have a lot of work to do uh, to continue on this. Um, but these are just the demographics of our group. Uh, there's two things to point out here in particular, um, and they're kind of a negative. One is that we're not enrolling enough men. The discrepancy here isn't as bad as it looks. It should be 80-20 rather than 90-10 because thyroid cancer affects women about 80% versus 20% for men. So we do need to do a little better job of recruiting men, and we need to do a little better job of recruiting uh, minorities as well. As you can see, the majority of our patients um, are uh, not minorities. Um, so the other thing that we're going to be doing is um, rolling this out into Cook County soon uh, to try to help to enroll more minority patients. So the other thing that this is designed to do is to be a longitudinal study. So we're going to be following these patients for several years. So we've only been recruiting for about four months. Um, and we anticipated this to be at least two years, if not five years in length. Um, but you can see that we have a pretty even distribution um, longitudinally already, um, which gives us a good understanding of how quality of life progresses over time after the thyroid cancer has been taken care of. <clears throat> Um, so the first thing that we wanted to do was to understand whether or not thyroid cancer care survivors um, had a similar quality of life to other cancer survivors. And this comes back to the concept that there's a discrepancy between what physicians believe and what patients are actually experiencing. As physicians, we're taught that thyroid cancer is the good cancer, and that if you treat the cancer, it has a 97% survival. It does have a fairly high recurrence rate. But because of that good survival, and because of the fact that you don't get chemotherapy or radiation therapy, essentially, from a physician standpoint, we say, well, we take out your thyroid, we send you home, and we expect you to do pretty well. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that's just not the case. So we were able to take some previous studies in the literature that were done on breast, colon, and glioma survivors and compared our data um, to um, the, uh, those other studies' data. And what we found essentially is that thyroid cancer survivors in quality of life terms look exactly the same as breast, colon, and glioma cancer survivors. There's no difference in anxiety. There's no difference in depression, hope, despair, happiness. Even their overall health and their overall quality of life are exactly the same as survivors of these other cancers, which is really not what we expect as physicians. And so we're already starting to see this discrepancy um, coming out in these data. And the point is, is once we can identify this discrepancy, we can start to talk to physicians about this and talk to physicians about understanding how their patients are really experiencing their disease. So, to get in more detail on the mismatch between what we expect and what's actually happening. Um, so the red bars are what physicians, um, in, this, in this case, these are the surgical complications. So these are the rates that we quote patients um, in terms of what their complications are going to be after surgery. So for a permanent voice change, so when we operate on the thyroid, there's a possibility of the patient losing their voice, and there's a possibility of their parathyroid glands being damaged, which causes really low calcium levels. 
Those are the two main things that we discuss in detail with the patients, or we should be discussing. But what we tell them essentially is that they have a 1% chance of permanent problems with these issues, and about a 5% chance of temporary problems with these issues. And these data are taken from the best literature, that, the best data that we have in the literature on what the actual complication rates are. But in our group of 1,000 patients, their reported complications are much higher than what we're telling them that they're supposed to be. So you can see that they are reporting permanent voice changes in 15% of cases, temporary voice changes in up to 30% of cases, and very similar numbers for the calcium. You have uh, about 8% per, um, permanent low, low calcium levels and about 32% low temporary low calcium levels. So there's a big discrepancy in what we're telling patients they should expect and what they're actually experiencing. And this can cause problems because if I'm telling the patient something, but they're experiencing something totally different, maybe they don't, are not going to trust me as much the next time I tell them something. And you're going to see this in a minute with some of these other data. So the other idea are the medication complications. So when they take radioactive iodine or when they take the um, hormone, the hormone that um, will replace the thyroid hormone that's been taken out from the thyroid, what are the differences there? So essentially the medical complications or the medicine-related complications, we tell patients are around the range of 1% to 5% for all these things that are on this graph. And you can see that up to 60% of patients report weight gain that they feel is directly related to the medications that they're taking or was directly related in some way to um, their treatment for their thyroid cancer. And it goes all uh, down the line here with weight loss, dry mouth, and several other complications that weren't even listed in our 77-question um, 77 77 questionnaire. So, the question is, is, is this really poor communication on our part? Um, and we haven't really gotten to the core of this yet, but there's some data here to, to point to the fact that maybe it is the idea that we are not communicating well with these patients. 34% of our respondents felt that their issues were not taken seriously by their physicians. That's a really high number if you think about it. One third of our patients feel like we're not listening to them when, when they talk to us. 23% of respondents felt that their issues were not taken seriously by their family members. So that's even more worrisome because what that means is that the family members possibly are in the conversation with us as the physicians in the visiting in the air in the um, treat, treatment room, and even the family members are taken away from the doctors the idea that that the patient shouldn't be having any problems and if they are that it must be in their head, and then the family members in turn are not even listening to their own family members when they're talking about having problems and issues. Twenty six percent of the respondents felt that the risks of the surgery were not adequately explained to the patient. Now, obviously, when you undergo a surgery, you're supposed to be told the risks and complications that can occur. But 26%, again, a quarter of the patients felt like that wasn't adequately explained. And 28% of the patients felt like the risks of the medical treatments were not well explained to the patients as well. <clears throat> So I do think that the, a lot of what we're seeing here in terms of this reduced quality of life and issues can be traced back to the idea that we're not communicating effectively with our patients and that we need to be um, educating physicians on these issues. Also, something that's also disturbing is the idea of financial implications in thyroid cancer survivorship. So we heard earlier that um, one of the big um, causes of bankruptcy in the United States is medical costs. We've done a study on um, thyroid cancer survivorship care in terms of cost. It's actually relatively inexpensive to take care of thyroid cancer care patients um, uh, when you compare it to other, th other cancer patients. So for example, um, a lifetime of cost to take care of a thyroid cancer patient is equivalent to one year of cost to take care of a breast cancer patient. Um, so you wouldn't expect them to have super high burden, financial burdens. But what we see is that 11% of our respondents had a history of bankruptcy. This is compared to 0.3%, which is what's in the national average. So our thyroid cancer patients are going bankrupt, but it's likely not from financial issues. So the question is, is are there other family problems that are happening and social problems that are happening in these patients that we as physicians are not aware of and that we need to be looking into more closely? Let's see. Let's, uh, so in summary, um, we can see that thyroid cancer survivors have a decrease in quality of life and is comparable to other cancer survivors, which is really something that we haven't really paid attention to before. There are significant discrepancies between what we think is happening as physicians and what's actually going on with the patients. And the, pro the real problem is, is that they feel ignored. They feel ignored by us and their family. They're having financial hardships. 
and that none of these issues are expected by physicians that are caring for these patients. So a lot more work needs to be done in terms of educating physicians on how they should be taking care of these patients. Um, there's a lot more work to be done with this study. Um, we expect to enroll at least 2,000 patients over the next year to two years. Um, that'll be a multicultural and uh, multi-ethnic group. Um, and there are several um, different aspects of looking into this. So thank you very much. Questions for Dr. Grogan? So those are very interesting and kind of disappointing results in a sense in terms of uh, what we as a professionals accomplish in terms of this disease. Um, I wonder if part of it is uh, the team approach to taking care of patients after their uh, thyroid operations and whether it's done mainly by surgeons who are busy without it being pejorative and if there was a team group of uh, social workers and physician internists and uh, surgeons who work together in a multidisciplinary clinic uh, whether some of this could be avoided. I think that's a very good question. There are some centers that have a, a really good multidisciplinary approach to this, um, but the majority of patients with thyroid cancer are taken care of in community settings where um, those kind of team approaches aren't necessarily um, done right now. Um, so I think that's a good idea and something one of the, we may want to include in the study, a center that has a multidisciplinary approach like that to see if there are differences in their quality of life outcomes. Ross? Ray, I was interested in, first of all, your talk was excellent, but I was interested in your consent process a little bit or just the way that patients perceive how we're consenting them. I think as surgeons, you know, when we consent people for an operations, it's so important that we appropriately explain the risks and benefits. And it seems like we're explaining one thing, the patient's experiences are completely different in terms of what happens and are we explaining things poorly or are we not managing expectations appropriately? Is there a way to get that to match a little bit better in terms of what we say the risk is versus what people are actually experiencing. Yeah, I think some of this goes back to what was mentioned earlier, where a lot of what we talk to patients about, they don't remember right after the fact. Um, Dr. Angelos did a study like that actually on our thyroid um, patients recently and showed very similar numbers to what were presented earlier, where the vast majority of information that we re relay is not being remembered or being remembered accurately. Um, and part of that, I think, comes from the fact that people are very nervous and very anxious when we're giving the, having these discussions. I mean, I always tell the residents and the medical students when they're in our clinic that this is most likely the worst day in this person's life. They've come into our clinic, and they have a diagnosis of cancer, so they're extremely nervous and they're extremely anxious. So it may be, and one of the things that we don't do is we don't really reiterate things. We go through the consent form once in clinic, but oftentimes we don't reinforce that over and over again. And that may be one of the things that we need to do in order to better communicate with patients. Wendy. Just a quick I think that's a great idea. And it's also interesting that it, that it wasn't just the surgeons, but also the medical physicians, the endocrinologists who are giving radioactive iodine and thyroid hormone, who the patients also felt weren't describing things the way that they should. So um, it may be a, a thing that's cultural among all physicians and not just surgeons in particular. I, I thought we saw the Mike Bishop data earlier today, you know, after the two-hour conversation, 80% of the do everything that we can. We have, we have a drawing that we draw out for the patients. We write on that drawing. We have a whole packet with all this information that's printed out in the same manner that we have talked about it that we give to the patient um, when they go home. Um, but even with all that, we did this study um, here, and we found very similar numbers to what were talked about on the Dr. Bishop's book about before. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Dara Richer Adams. Uh, Dara is a second year um, medical student at Pritzker, graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, um, who worked at, at the Bain Company for three years before coming to Pritzker. Um, here at Pritzker, uh, Dara has worked with Vinnie Aurora on the relationship between patient satisfaction and communication among providers. Uh, Dara's title today is a missed opportunity to improve patient satisfaction, patient perceptions of inpatient communication with their primary care physician. Dara, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Ziegler. 
Um, before I start, I'd like to thank my mentors, Dr. Aurora and Dr. Meltzer. Today, we're going to be talking about patient perceptions of inpatient communication with their primary care physician, a potential missed opportunity to improve patient satisfaction. Patient satisfaction is in the spotlight for hospitals for a number of reasons. First of all, and the reason that we're here today, is because it is one metric that can shed light on the strength of the doctor-patient relationship. Patients also have access to this data on websites like Hospital Compare, and they can use the data to decide where to go for their care. And finally, in the future, hospital reimbursement may be tied to patient satisfaction outcomes. Now, one thing that may influence patient satisfaction is their perception of coordination of care. Actually, Dr. Levinson mentioned coordination of care today in her wedge of waste. And patients also find fault with coordination of care. This is a Commonwealth Fund study from 2011 that looked at various patient reports of failures of care, such as doctors failing to give information to another doctor that the patient thought should have that information. And as you can see, significant numbers of patients found failures of coordination of care. And as the number of providers increased that these patients saw, they found more failures of care. So patient perceptions of continuity of care between their inpatient and outpatient providers can be, may be related to satisfaction. Now, prior research has looked to see if they can find a link between um, patient reports of communication and, out and outcomes after, um, after being in the hospital, and unfortunately have not found a link. However, few studies have actually studied patient perceptions of coordination of care. So our aim is to characterize the relationship between overall patient satisfaction and patient perceptions of communication between the hospital team and PCPs. This project is part of the broader, ongoing hospitalist project. And from 2003 to 2013, all general medicines, medicine patients at the University of Chicago were interviewed. And then we selected a subset of patients to follow up by telephone four weeks after discharge. And we asked these patients two specific, we asked them lots of questions, but in this uh, presentation, we're specifically talking about two patient satisfaction questions, overall satisfaction, as well as satisfaction specifically with their inpatient, outpatient care. We also reached out to their primary care physicians by mail and asked them whether they had communicated with the inpatient team. And we took the primary care physician reports of communication as the gold standard for whether or not that communication had occurred. We then completed a chart review and did both descriptive statistics as well as a statistical test called the Kruskal Wallace test to understand the association between patient satisfaction and their perceptions of communication. And in between 2003 and 2013, we had 804 patients, 76 percent of the subset of patients that we included in our study respond to all three surveys including their PCP survey. Our patients are 73% are female and 71% African American, which is similar to the patient population at this hospital. And importantly, we oversampled on frail elders as well. First, we looked at overall patient satisfaction. On the left, you can see patient satisfaction overall. And 62% of patients were satisfied with their hospital care. Now, we consider satisfaction to be excellent or very good on a scale that also includes good, fair, and poor. However, only 50% of patients were satisfied with their inpatient, outpatient coordination. So as you can see, patients are less satisfied with their coordination of care than they are with their overall care. We also looked to see whether patient perceptions of communication aligned with the actual communication that was happening in the hospital. So on the left, these are all of the primary care physicians that reported communication. And you can see that just under 70% of their patients perceived communication, meaning that about 30% of patients actually weren't sure that their physicians had communicated when they did, in fact, communicate. On the right, you can see 
PCPs that reported no communication. And we were surprised to find that over half of those patients actually thought that communication had occurred, pointing to a potential safety issue if patients think that test results or various reports on their hospital stay have been given to their primary care physician when, in fact, they haven't. Next, we look to see if there is a correlation between patient between patient, sat patient perceptions of communication and overall satisfaction. And we found on the left here, these are, all, these are patients who perceived communication, and the second column is patients that did not think that communication happened. And you can see that patients who perceived communication were more satisfied with their overall care than patients who did not. On the right, you see PCP reports of communication, and you can see that whether or not the PCPs reported communication, in other words, whether or not the communication actually happened, did not influence patient overall satisfaction. We did a similar study with inpatient satisfaction specifically with inpatient outpatient coordination. And you can see here that the difference is even greater among patients that thought that communication happened were more satisfied with their coordination of care than patients who didn't. And on the right, you can see that PCP reports of care are less strongly correlated, though still correlated, with patient satisfaction with their inpatient outpatient coordination. We also looked at acute care events after discharge, so emergency room visits or urgent care visits at our hospital and other hospitals, as reported by the patients. And we, uh, we found that what patient perceptions of communication had no relationship with whether or not an acute care event happened. And PCP reports of communication are also not statistically significant in terms of relating to whether or not an acute care event happened. However, you can see that this looks like a trend here, so potentially we're underpowered to show a correlation between communication and outcomes. So as the study continues, potentially the next time you hear about this, we will be able to talk about uh, a significant outcome. Our study has some limitations, so we can't prove causality in the relationship between satisfaction and perceptions of communication and it was only done at this one institution. So in summary, we found that patients overestimated their hospital team primary care physician communication when the communication didn't happen. We also found that patient perceptions of communication are correlated with patient satisfaction. So in an effort to be hospital-centered, hospitals can increase efforts to educate patients on when that communication actually happens, and this may be one way to improve, one factor to improve patient satisfaction. There have been many people that have helped me with this project on the slide. I'd like to, again, highlight my mentors, Dr. Aurora and Dr. Meltzer, and to thank the Buxbaum Institute for the, their support. Thank you very much. Any sure. Any questions for Dara? Yes, Tracy. Okay. We were discussing this because one of the things that doesn't happen in this institution is the facts, the discharge summary to the PCP, which we once again begged the hospital to do, and they said that that was an antiquated version of communication and they weren't going to do it. And it, it it continues to be something, as an ICU physician, I feel like they need a summary and I could call them every day, but that's not going to do them as much good as having a piece of paper for a year down the road. Right. So I, I think there's a lot that we can do here and perhaps your study will get administration to understand that. I <laughs> would be great. <laughs> yes, Diva. Thank you very much. This is a great topic. Sure. Um, I think the one question also is becomes along the lines of discharge summary, how readable are discharge summaries, right. how useful are they, and how are we doing in terms of patients actually understanding themselves what also happened in the hospital? And any any thoughts of improving patient satisfaction by, I, I don't want to create more documents, but this idea is that this discharge summary itself is often very dense and filled with things that none of us can really understand and go through. Right. So the question becomes, is there some need for 
other methods of, of, of translating that if we have gaps in how, how to bring it to the primary care doctor or something like that? Absolutely. I, yeah, I completely agree. I actually think there is a group doing research on discharge summaries as well. Um, there is one? I, I believe so. I, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so we, that's actually our plan for the next phase <laughs> of this project is to, that's one of the things that we want to look into is to see if there are specific characteristics about that patient population and to see, uh, we actually asked patients how they thought the communication happened. So did they think it was email, telephone, fax, et cetera? So that is one of the things that we are looking to look into. Uh, Arthur, I mean, oh. So I wanted to do patients have access to their medical records here? Uh, uh, logging in with some uh, password? They don't yet, but they are going to, so, so I uh, hear. <laughs> we've made a hu at the University of Pennsylvania, we've opened up the records to patients and their designees, which could be family members or primary care physicians. And this has dealt with this issue of discharge summaries and everything because uh, their physicians, when they come back, can just access their records. And it's not as perfect as a summary, but all the labs, everything is available to them. And I think it's been a huge, you know, everyone worried that it would make patients crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, but as usual, that was wrong. <laughs> and uh, patients seem to have benefited enormously. And it's removed a lot of this uncertainty about what actually happened to them. And it's a simple answer, well, a complicated answer to a complicated problem. But it certainly works very well in many circumstances. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's going to be rolled out at our hospital soon. And also, one other thing is that over this 2003 to 2013 period, our EMR was actually rolled out, and that's another tool for communication that we're hoping to look into to see if there are differences in communication before and after the EMR was instituted. One, one last question, Tao. Sure. That was, very, uh, uh, that was part of my initial question, because in the near future, the PCPO whoever the refer physician will easily access to this uh, discharge summary almost immediately or very con convenient way. But only if, if they have access, only if they're epic or, in the limit of the, the, or, 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 right. or a limited number of doctors that we're going to give huge access to. Right. Even for <laughs> this limited doctor, do you think <laughs> this electronic access can repress this personal phone call to, to create a similar patient satisfaction? Absolutely. There are definitely my guess would be that there are changing methods of communication, that if we looked from 2003 to now, it's probably shifted towards, um, towards email. But we'll find out. All right. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks very much. Our next speaker will be Aubrey Jordan, a second-year medical student, a graduate of Johns Hopkins University. Um, uh, Aubrey is going to talk to us today about a topic called surgery, surgeon, family, perioperative communication, surgeons, self-reported approaches. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I'd like to thank Dr. Siegler and the Buxbaum Institute for their support of this research overall and for inviting me to speak. And I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Alex Langerman. So the waiting room is a unique space in the hospital for many reasons, but perhaps most notably for the communication that occurs there. Communication there occurs between surgeons and family members about patients in the patient's absence. And despite the ubiquitous nature of this practice, it has never before been reported on in the literature. <laughs> and so I was interested in understanding perioperative surgeon family communication better. And so last summer, I addressed this topic from a number of different angles. But the angle I'm going to focus on today in my talk is the surgeon component. And so I interviewed 13 surgeons across nine specialties at the University of Chicago. And I used an open interview format. And I started each interview with the same question. How do you approach speaking to the family members of your surgical patients? These interviews were then transcribed and coded according to an iterative process of qualitative theme development. And the goal of these interviews was to gain a preliminary understanding of how surgeons conceptualize the act of speaking to families perioperatively. And we coded our results according to three major elements of two-party communication. What informs the communication? How is the communication practiced? And how are the skills integral to communication taught? So first off, what informs the communication? 
When surgeons are asked about perioperative communication with families, they universally report that it's the smart practice of a good surgeon, but not one upon which they had widely reflected. They overall say it's just what you do to fulfill your position and abide by decorum. Outside of the perioperative period, surgeons understand the roles of family member and patient care as one of an advocate or someone to collaborate with in coordinating care. But within the perioperative period, that shifts. Surgeons across the board really recognize that family members had their own unique psychosocial and emotional needs during the perioperative period. And in this way, the dynamic between surgeons and family members shifted perioperatively to be one of a pseudo-surgeon-patient dynamic. This is a focus of our research, and I'll return to it in a moment. And so from this recognition of a psychosocial and emotional need on the part of the family members, surgeons really unanimously said that the goal of speaking to families perioperatively was to try to alleviate their anxiety, address this emotional need. One surgeon highlights this point here, saying, my point really is to try to alleviate anxiety, because if you think about it, the family members are probably among the most anxious of anyone there, because they are going to sit there for three or four hours and have no clue what's going on. And so how do surgeons accomplish this goal? If the point of communication is to alleviate anxiety, how do they go about that? And surgeons, the majority of surgeons that we spoke to said that they understood surgeon, or excuse me, family member anxiety to be hinging on needing a general sense of security, that the patient was okay, just a general understanding. And surgeons saw them addressing this need by providing their presence, calm reassurances, and general statements about the patient's status, rather than some detailed understanding about how the patient's operation went. And this surgeon quote, the surgeon's quote um, shows that. I think that first of all, they want to know how the surgery went. The second thing is, is he awake? Those are the two important things. They're not interested in much else. And so on to the second element of how we um, analyzed our results. How is the communication practiced? So there are really three points during the perioperative period in which surgeons and families can communicate. Preoperatively, intraoperatively with update calls from the OR, and postoperatively with a discussion either in person or over the phone. And surgeons can pick and choose from these various avenues in constructing their own approach. And so for an example, a surgeon may insist on meeting with family members preoperatively, not have any update calls, and then make a phone call postoperatively to just retouch on those points that are brought up in the pre, uh, pre-op discussion. Alternatively, another surgeon may skip pre-op, have update calls every two hours from the OR, and then meet postoperatively with the family members in person, and et cetera. There are many different variations on this, and surgeons uh, construct their own unique approach. And you can see in the bottom bar here of this table that's just uh, quantifying how the surgeons that were interviewed used each of these uh, different avenues, that they all use the post-operative time as a time to speak with family members, whether by phone or in person. And so we wanted to drill in on this post-op discussion period because it seemed like surgeons were focusing their efforts here as a time when they could accomplish their goal with family members and Uh, alleviate their anxiety by conveying the sense that the patient was okay. And so how did they do that? How did they construct an approach that would convey this to family members? Well, in our analysis of the themes that we pulled out from the interviews that I conducted, we found that there are really three elements by which the surgeons defined their own approach. The first element was, did they say just the facts or add supportive content? And this quote says it perfectly, really. The extremes would be somebody who's going to sit with them for an extended period of time, a lot of hand-holding and more sort of supportive content than factual content. And at the other end is sort of factual content and a minimum of supportive content and more brief. So people are all over the spectrum. I tend to be more at the second end, which is more brief and content is objective. And the second way surgeons define their approach was whether they say the same spiel every time they speak with family members, the same content, go down a checklist every time, or whether they based their content as, and adapted it on a perception of the family's level of sophistication. And it's notable this term level of sophistication is in quotes because that is a direct quote from a number of interviews unprompted. Surgeons had a common understanding and common way of phrasing this idea, level of sophistication. And here's an example. I give the spiel depending on an assessment of the patient and family. If it's a very sophisticated patient and family, then I'll go into a lot of detail. If it is what I perceive to be a less sophisticated patient and family, I'll do a little bit less detail. And the third way surgeons defined their own approach to the post-operative discussion was whether they spoke in broad terms or shared more technical detail. So one surgeon illustrates his approach by saying, 
So you know we took out the lobes, about as technical as I get. And so there's variability, of course, across all of these three elements. I'm highlighting the extremes. But perhaps most so in this element, where some surgeons had a list that they planned to check off of what had been discussed preoperatively or in clinic and what they wanted to now address postoperatively. And other surgeons just simply said that they planned to say, the surgery's over, the patient did fine, you can see him at X time. And so the final element that we uh, analyzed our results along was how is perioperative surgeon family communication taught? And how are the skills relevant to it taught? And the short answer is, it's not. Of the 13 surgeons we interviewed, only one routinely brought residents with him to speak with families postoperatively. And I can say that most of them said they never did. Um, and as a consequence of this practice, surgeons reported learning to speak to families, quote, on the fly as they became attendings. And this is an alarming realization because According to ACGME core competency requirements, all graduating residents need to have proficiency speaking to patients and their families. And so the goal of this study was to gain a preliminary understanding of how surgeons conceptualize speaking to families perioperatively. And earlier on, I mentioned this dynamic that changed in the perioperative period, where surgeons and families began to have this pseudo patient surgeon dynamic. And I'd like to revisit that here in light of our overall findings. So we found that surgeons do see perioperative communication with families as their responsibility. We found that they understood the goal of perioperative communication to be alleviating family members' anxieties. And we saw that they had a varied approach and a unique approach to fulfilling this responsibility. And so these three points, acknowledgement of a direct responsibility, a goal of caring for the family members and their own needs, and variation and development of a unique approach to accomplishing this goal, in our, in our minds provides evidence of a unique surgeon family relationship rather than an extension or variation of the surgeon patient relationship. And so in conclusion, we define the surgeon family relationship as a relationship between a surgeon and the family member of a surgical patient, distinct from that between the surgeon and patient, characterized by perioperative emotional and cognitive support. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the Arnold P. Gold Foundation and the Buxbaum Institute again, the Operative Performance Research Institute, and I'll take any questions. Laura, please. It's a wonderful study and oh, a sweet study, I think important. I'm curious if you were surprised by what you found. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, was, I think I was most surprised by the fact of that it was so on the fly, as they said, you know, that something was kind of just do what you do what comes naturally almost when you walk in the door um, to such a tender moment. Um, that surprised me. And I I was also surprised by um, the the level of sophistication moment that that idea. Um, I don't have the right answer for that. I don't know if there is one. But I think that it's something that should definitely be studied as to how to best communicate these things to different people on a number of variables, not only their sophistication. Um, so all those things were really interesting to me. What, what surprised me was one of the earliest things that Aubrey said. And that is, there are more than 2 million operations a year in the United States. And nobody has looked at this question before of the communication between the surgeons and the families. I mean, a communication which takes place two million times a year. That, I, I found that to be stunning. Um, and so I think this study is a very important one. I, I like your definition at the end of the surgeon family relationship as a, as a new relationship to think about. Um, yes, Jim. Yeah. Um, so the, sur the surgeons that did um, believe that it, it could be taught, and there was variation in that belief, um, said that they thought that it would need to be a formal curriculum, basically. So there would be, you know, some concentration of time that a surgical resident would be designated to follow surgeons' attendings to these conversations. And exactly what you said was the common point as to why it isn't currently happening. And so I think just saying, well, it should happen isn't helpful because that's a very valid reason. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like the next step when you have time is to see what the families thought about the interaction because maybe they were totally satisfied. 
So we did that this summer, actually, too. That's the part I didn't. Why and did they yeah, so they were largely satisfied. Um, and so another part of my uh, study was to actually observe the communication as well. And so I can say from these three components that really the expectations of the family members is based on what they see around them and what they think is normal. And so when they have an interaction with the surgeons, they don't really know any different and they expect it to be that way. But I think that that shouldn't be our goal. I think that our goal should be to provide the best communication possible, not just what satisfies the family members. But that was a, um, a very interesting finding from these three components of my summer. I guess my point was, if they were satisfied, is there things they would want more? Like you say, that you could then inform the surgeons that that would be uh, preferable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think as a student who had never been exposed to these conversations before, it was really interesting to me how m much of it is already planned and known and routine by the time that you get to the operation. And so that was something that was really an initial interest of mine. And I think that I'd have to expand to get enough um, exposure to those cases. But very interesting. Wonderful paper. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.